Amen. I want to talk to you out of Judges chapter 17. Turn there with me. About 10 shekels, clothes, and food. Somebody say 10 shekels, clothes, and food. Thank you. If you have never heard this story before, I promise after hearing it today, you won't forget it. It's a popular story that preachers have been preaching for years. A man by the name of Paris Wrighthead preached it a while back. You can find it online, 10 shekels in a shirt. But what I want to do is add some twists to it today for what we're going through in the culture. Somebody say, make it plain. Amen. Thank you. Judges chapter 17, verse 1 is the beginning of this story. Now, a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim or Ephraim, said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse. Somebody say a curse. Thank you. I have that silver with me. I took it. Now you're going to understand just how crazy it was during this time. The book of Judges is seated historically before the book of Kings and before the temple was built, but after the exile. It takes place roughly after the time of Joshua. You can consider him a first judge if, if you want to see it that way. But judges were also prophets, so it can get a little bit mixed up when you try to know the difference between a prophet and a judge. But, with, but what we need to know about the time frame is it's after Joshua brought them to the promised land, but they did not take all of the promised land. And God said, if you don't do that, you will begin to worship the other gods and intermarry with them and be defiled. You're going to see how that's a part of this story. And uh, later on, we're going to know in the, the Bible that David and Solomon come and build a temple. And so there's not yet quite a temple, but there is a Levitical priesthood. There is the tabernacle, the traveling uh, temple that has the Ark of the Covenant. Now, during this time, as you read the book of Judges, you do not want to look at these people as good examples. One man said, if God gives me victory, I'll kill the first thing that comes out of my house, and it was his virgin daughter. And now atheists want to use that against you and say, uh, well, this person did such and such a thing. No, he was wicked. Other times they'll talk about Samson being the first suicide bomber. Samson there in the house brought it down on himself. But that wasn't God's plan. That was his own stupidity. He asked to die there. He wasn't supposed to die there. And he was a wicked man most of his life. He did kill a lot at the end, but that wasn't how he was supposed to die. And so I could give you more examples about a man that was a coward and God had to raise up a female judge named Deborah to be an awesome, mighty woman of God. And I would say probably for, for the book of Judges, she's the hero of the book. So be like Deborah. But you see here a crazy story, and it's going to get even more messy. But here's how it starts out. Micah stole money from his mother, 1,100 uh, shekels. He then heard his mama curse whoever stole it. So he gets scared, comes back, and says, Mama, I'm the one that stole it. Let me give it back to you. And she said, The Lord bless you, son. She was happy about that. Now keep going, verse 3. It says, when he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly swear to consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver. I'll give it back to you. Now, this is where it just gets even more bizarre and crazy. She's happy that she got her money back, and she's going to dedicate it to God, but she dedicates, dedicates it now to the making of an idol. So instead of sending it to Jerusalem, Judea, where these Levites were hanging out at that time, she says, I'm going to take this silver and now make an idol. Some may say, Lord, help her. So she does this, and let's see here what happens. Verse 4, so afterward, the silver, uh, he returned the silver to his mother. She took 200 shekels of silver and gave it to a silversmith who used them to make the idol, and it was put in Micah's house. How much did she get back? 1,100 shekels. Somebody say 1,100. How much did she use to make the idol? 200. So she's already lying now. This is like a Nias and Sapphira situation. She's like, Lord, I'm going to dedicate it all to you. And then when time came around to do that, she's like, I'm just going to give you 200 of it. I'm going to keep the other 900 shekels. And if you know in the New Testament, people lied about their offerings. So be careful in church. Can I get a well? All right, y'all better be careful in church because that's the New Testament. A lot of times people go, oh, God was crazy in the Old Testament. Oh, same God. We're the ones that are crazy, both Old and New Testament. And so 
as a way of saying thank you to God that she got her money back, she's now going to break God's command by making an idol. That's one of the Ten Commandments she wasn't supposed to. And then she's going to lie about what she's going to give to God. So verse 5, they make this idol, and they now put it in Micah's house, and he makes a shrine. He makes an ephod, which is like a priestly robe, and then he adds some of his household gods to this situation here, and it says he made one of his sons his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. How many know the author of Judges here has a sense of humor? He just paused this right there and goes, and by the way, they were crazy. They had no idea what they were doing. There was no king. There was no leadership. So let's just summarize the story. Micah steals from his mom. His mama puts out a curse. He then gives it back. His mom dedicates it to God, but then only uses some of it for God, but then changes the God she's going to give it towards and then puts it towards an idol and then says, Micah, now you make a shrine to worship this thing. And then Micah says, I got a bunch of other false gods I'll put with this false god, and then I'll just pick out one of my sons to be a priest. This is supposed to be the Jewish people who already knew the Ten Commandments, who actually got a book called Leviticus to teach them about the proper way to worship God through the tribe of Levi and the priests. But they are messed up. Now notice this right here, verse 7. A young Levite, who we were just talking about, from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living in the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. So now you got a Levite entering into the story, and instead of him being the hero of the story, we see that he's running away from his own people for a better opportunity, and then look at what happens here on his way. Just guess who he ran upon? He came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. You see, messy people will always find messy people. I always notice that in the church. I'll know if you're messy if you start hanging out with the messy people. Birds of like feathers flock together. So now here's a Levite that's supposed to be doing the right thing with his clan living in Judah, but now he's wandering off like a prodigal son looking for a better deal, a better thing to do, and he runs up upon Micah. Let's see what Micah does right here. He runs upon Micah. Micah asked him, where are you from? Verse 9, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. He said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, praise the Lord. I've been praying about this. Live with me and be my father and priest. And I will give you, somebody say, 10 shekels. 10 shekels of silver a year. Your clothes. Somebody say, your clothes. And your food. Say, your food. Thank you. He says, I'm going to give you 10 shekels of silver. I'm going to give you some clothes, and I'm going to give you some food. So the Levite, praise God, jumped up and down and began to live with him. And the young man became like one of his sons, which is weird. He says to this man, be a father. This is where we get the pagan idea of Roman Catholicism to make a priest a father. So this guy says to him, be my father and priest, but he's really one of the only, uh, just around the age of his sons. And it says, then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. This is just part of the story. You've learned about three characters. You've learned about Micah, who's a thief. You've learned about his mother, who doesn't know how to worship the right God. And then you've learned about a Levite, who's just an opportunist. And now they're all together worshiping a false God with what they think is the approval of God because that's how it's all working so good. Does anybody know where I'm going right now into this generation? Let's make some application. Can you say make it plain? I wonder how many people out here are trying to steal things from the previous generation but without giving credit to where credit is due. You see, that mother had that money to begin with because God had blessed his people and brought them out of bondage. That was meant for the worship of God. And I look around here today, and I can tell you all of us can look back in our history and see that we have an inheritance of the things of God that have been passed down to us like a baton in a race, and this is our time to shine. But instead, Instead of coming to those who have that inheritance, we are stealing it for our own good. 
And then we get scared when we see the curses. And so then we realize, oh, Beyonce learned how to sing in church. And then she starts to see that it works out for her. But then she gets scared of all the problems. So she needs a religion to scratch that itch and a God to get her back. So she says, I'm going to give it back to where I got it. But it's not really the way it's supposed to be done because then the generation takes what is meant to be worshipped before God and then makes a false God to be their idol. The theologian said it like this, we're all worshipers of God. It's just what God are we worshipping? You look at all the people who've gotten their talents and their gifts like Steve Jobs was spared from an abortion and he got that gift to create things and then when he saw when his, and his life was falling apart after it went really good, he reached a mountaintop but he realized that wasn't enough and sent it to a turn to the God of his forefathers, he turned to Buddhism and false religion, and it tore him down even further. Like Micah, instead of taking that which we have stolen and given back and now using it for the things of God, we are using it for our own selfishness, and then we're calling this thing our God. We're calling this thing the one who blessed us. We're giving this thing the attributes of our God, but it's really just an idol. What has this generation done with all of their gifts, with all of their talents? They've made them into idols. I've had people tell me I can't serve God this way at this Bible study, at this thing because of my job. Who gave you that job? God gave you that job. But now you want to make that job into an idol. But now watch. That's what the world does, and we see it all over the place, don't we? We see the world using the gifts that God gave them for their own benefit to a false God, but it's also in the church because there's another kind of person that then says, but I need a priest. I need a house of worship. I need a place to go on Sunday because I think that that's how I'm going to worship God. And so now they look for a pastor They look for a leader that got just as much junk in the trunk as they do. They look for somebody that's running away from their call as well. They're looking for somebody, in other words, that's not going to get in their business because they got too much business that they don't want anybody to know about. So they find a church. They find a pastor that will leave them alone, and then they'll leave them alone, and then they make an agreement, don't touch my business, I won't touch your business. Let's just do religion together because I know God will be good to us. And then they start to look around at all their blessings. We've got silver. We've got food. We've got clothes. We've got a mega church. We've got TV stations. We've got best-selling books. We're invited on the talk shows. And then they say, I know this must be God because God wouldn't have brought me a Levite. God wouldn't have brought me 10 shekels of silver unless I was doing his will. And what we call this now is pragmaticism. Pragmaticism has slipped into the church and is really at the root of so many of our problems. And pragmaticism says, if it works, it must be right. If it doesn't work, it must be wrong. So in the church setting, if the goal is getting people through the doors, and if we preach the word of God the way it's supposed to be preached and it makes them mad and it makes them not want to come back and it makes them want to put bad reviews on our Facebook page, can I get free and talk to somebody here? Then they start to say to themselves, well, it must not be right. I must be doing something wrong because I'm getting wrong results. So then they remove the crosses from the church. They begin to do more plays than they do preaching. They then find out what the people want to hear, and what they want to hear is that you're going to make it. You're going to get your blessing. And so they keep preaching about the blessings and how they're getting a 121st breakthrough. And now because that works, they put the stamp of God on it and say it must be good. But it's not Christianity. It's pragmaticism. And if you compare it to Scientology, then Scientology must be good because they're building buildings too. And then the nation of Islam must be good because what they're doing is working too. And then Mormonism must be good because Mormonism is working too. You see, Christianity is not about what you get from God. It's about what God gets out of you. This is not pragmaticism. 
This is not pragmatism. Things will work out in the kingdom of God, but oftentimes it will come through suffering. Because if we're judging the people of the Bible by pragmatism, our heroes are now failures. Starting with Jesus, the biggest failure of them all. Jesus wasn't growing a church. He was losing a church. Everywhere he went, he gets a crowd, then they leave him. He gets a crowd, and then he leaves, they leave him. And then one of his closest friends betrays him. And then out of the ones who stayed, 11 of the disciples, all of them get tortured for their beliefs. Ten of them die as martyrs. Talk about failing at winning friends and influencing people. These guys were the worst. And then the churches that they start, the churches especially by the Apostle Paul and Peter, we see by the time the book of Revelation is written just 30 or 40 years after they were founded, all of them except a few are being rebuked. And God says to one of the churches, y'all so bad you make me puke. You're lukewarm. So is Jesus a bad savior? Are the disciples bad apostles? When you look to the epistles, which are the letters of the apostles, most of them are correcting the problems and the messes within the church. And so if pragmatism was the standard of judgment over our scriptures, then our prophets would be failures, our apostles would be failures, Jesus himself would be a failure. But my friends, God is not a means to an end. God is the end of all means. Let me just help you understand that. God is not the thing you go to to then get something else, like you going through him to get your blessing, going through him to get eternal life, going through him to get a better job, going through him to get your life together. No, when you come to Christ, he is the end of all pursuit. He is that which you have been looking for in a job and in a family. The Bible says in him we are seated in heavenly places, blessed with every spiritual blessing. God is not the means to the end. He is the end of all means. And so this is how we are to look at Christianity is it's not about how we are in the experience of it at the moment. It is are we being obedient to God in that moment. How Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego might have felt in those moments were feelings of fear, trepidation. They might have been questioning their own decisions. There might have been some kind of betrayal between their other friends because there was a lot of Jews there at that time. Why are these the only four being mentioned? Come on, somebody. But yet they had to be obedient despite their feelings. That's why you have to wake up and not ask yourself how you feel, but tell yourself how to feel. You've got to command yourself to rejoice and find hope and and joy in the things of God. And so pragmatism is seen in this story. Everybody seems like they got the blessing of God because everything's working out. And sadly, in our churches today, that's how they're judging other churches. Joe, you're a bad pastor. Why? Because after 10 years, you're still in a storefront. We already on our fourth, fifth church. We doing all of this. Oprah had me on for the best selling book review. You're not doing it right, Pastor. You've got to do it more like this. But you see, birds of like feathers flock together. The reason why they're letting them on that show is because they know that they're not going to mess with her worldview and she's not going to mess with their worldview. They're just going to keep it surface. Just as long as there's 10 shekels, a shirt, and some food being exchanged, I'm good, you good, let's just go on. And you will always find, listen to me, you will always find a church to feel comfortable if that's what you're looking for. Because there are pastors that just need your shekels, the money you're going to give for their clothes and for their food, and they'll let you be how you want to be. I don't normally name names, but when I do, everybody pays attention, so get ready. A long time ago, I was calling out Willow Creek in the suburbs, and I was saying gently at that time, I've got concerns about the method of their ministry. They would invite CEOs who were ungodly to come to their conferences. Bill Clinton even came to one of their conferences. They prided themselves in being able to make friends with the rich and the wealthy of Barrington and all of those communities. And my friends who were raised up knew better, but they were being enticed and tantalized by their success. 
Because all night prayer meetings may not bring you that businessman the, as quick as you offering him something free with Bill Clinton coming to a conference. And so I started watching my friends make these trades, and I got concerned. And I said to them, I'm just warning you. Something in my spirit tells me this ain't right. Now, some of you say, well, pastor, did you judge him? Yeah, I judge him just like you judge a babysitter. You going to let anybody babysit your kids? I make judgments as a pastor of what I think people should listen to, what they shouldn't. If you don't want a pastor like that, find one of them for the 10 shekels and shirt then. But listen to me. I've just got to keep it real. Now, up to you. That's your decision. I'm not your Holy Spirit, so I don't follow you home or live inside of you, okay? I'm not going to be in your closet jumping out, boo, why are you listening to this person? But let me just... Just be honest with you. I called it out, and then what came about? What did they find out? From day one, he was kissing on women that wasn't his wife. He was doing these adulterous, crazy things from day one. Day one on the trips in the back rooms and all of this, touching on women's legs, being inappropriate. And so then it gets exposed. But watch, it's too late. The damage has already been done. The thousands have already walked through the door. They've already been taught the 10 shekels in a shirt works. And so it's like trying to gather all the feathers of a pillow that you just opened up on the freeway. You can't get it back. See, the devil, he'll use and abuse you just to get his kingdom to go further. He'll use and abuse you just to go a little bit further. So when he got done still killing and destroying that pastor's life, the damage was done. And now they're trying to recoup what now looks like a mall and their church is falling apart. And we need to pray that they get on fire and start preaching the real gospel. But I'm saying that to warn us that when it happened, when it was going on, people thought I was crazy. They said, Pastor, you're just jealous. Here you are in the storefront. This is the size of their bathroom. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the size of one of their classrooms. You're just jealous of them. I said, no, man, just something in my spirit just tells me it's a bait and switch. It's a tactic. It's a device of the enemy to trick us into thinking that's how we're going to do it. The other deception that comes along with pragmatism and they're tied together is humanism. And humanism is whatever makes a person happy must be good. And so you begin to see in the church that if it's the gospel preaching as we do here and somebody gets mad, somebody gets upset, that couldn't be Jesus because it didn't make them happy. And so the churches began to judge themselves on how well do we make you happy. Let's go and take surveys. Let's go and ask your friends and neighbors. How can we preach to make you happy? Biblical preaching obviously doesn't make you happy, but getting three steps to a better you, that will make you happy. How to get something for nothing, that will make you happy. All of the talk of prosperity based in greed. Are you listening? And what began to happen in the church as they put humanism above the cross is they made those people their idols. And so now you have the exchange with the pastor saying, I'll, I'll be your idol, I'll be your priest, I'll be a father to you. Just as long as you don't get in my business, I won't get in your business. You stay on the surface happy, and I'll keep trying to make you happy. Tap dancing here for you. Another name. His name is Todd White. Love him. He has dreadlocks, powerful testimony delivered off of drugs. I began to notice in his ministry that the way he would preach would always be like, do you want God to do something in your life? Okay, well, then let's pray about that. And there would never be any mention of a person's sin or needing to turn for their wicked ways. It was always, what do you need in your life? I've got a magic genie. I mean, God, Jesus, who will do this for you. Let's connect on that, and then I'm going to get you to follow me. And I was telling people, guys, I know he looks sincere. He loves people. I know that he's really genuinely trying to help them. But there's something about his message that is incomplete. And now as of last week, God bless him, he came out in a repentance video with weeping and tears saying that I am sorry I have not been preaching the full gospel. I keep wanting to run ahead to heaven without talking about hell. I keep wanting to run ahead. Come on, let's give God glory. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And I shared it, and I'm telling you, I'm here to support people. I'm not here to put them down, but I'm just here to make it plain so you know what I'm talking about in these dangerous times because it's so deceptive. It's not that in his case he was even going to hell. I don't think Joe Lowstein's going to hell. I just think that they have bought into humanism, and they are dangerously close to hell. 
And the problem isn't that we uh, should, uh, you know, not love people. Of course we should love people, but we should love them enough to tell them the whole truth. We should tell them enough, uh, love them enough to tell them there is a heaven, there is a hell. That's why Jesus spoke more about hell than he did even about heaven, and I think he's the most loving man there is. And that's because he was putting that into every one of his warnings, even into scriptures like I've shared before. You may not even think that it belongs in there, but it does for God so loved the world, right? That's the most popular scripture. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You can't skip over the perishing. And so when you think about this story and the characters that we're introduced to, it is very relevant to our life today that sadly... Not only in the world are they following humanism and pragmatism, but today in the church. And it's so hard for Christians to know the difference because they're judging it based on their feelings. I have a video that I had shared with some people who had left our church during this time, and they had said, you know, just pray for us because I'm trying to say, come on back. It's safe. We're good. Everybody's fine here, you know. And they're saying, well, you know, I guess the Lord just moved us on during that scary time, so just pray for us in our journey, and I appreciate you, and I don't want to be disrespectful. You know, they said all those nice things. So then I was also that same day on Facebook, and I saw an author who was a Christian and married man with family come out as a homosexual. And in his, his Facebook post, he talks about how tough a decision it was and how hard it was to be honest with himself. But now, with the support of his wife, the Christians in his community, he is now going to divorce his wife, live a gay lifestyle, and he wants everybody, watch, to pray for him on his journey and support him with his decision. Well, you know what I did. I went back to those folks, sent them that link, quoted him, and I said, you sound just like him. Because true humility is not asking your pastor or Christian friend just to pray for you and support you on your journey. True humility is to submit yourself to the wisdom and the teaching of God and to be accountable to the lifestyle of holiness to be as Christ. You see, this Levite had a lot of obligations back in Judah. If they even touched a dead person and tried to come around the Ark of the Covenant, they could die. If they started to lose their eyesight, didn't have 20-20, they would have to stop ministering directly into the presence of the Lord. They could do other things. But listen, they had to live by a strict code. But when Micah could do whatever he wanted to do and still be a priest... And sad today, that's what I see happening across the church. And we need to wake up and say, no, I don't serve pragmatism. I don't serve a humanism. I'm not here for the praises of the people. I'm here for the glory of my God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Let's meet the next characters in this crazy and wild story. They're called the Danites. They enter in at chapter 18, and they're a wild tribe, and they're supposed to be godly like the rest of the tribes, but they're just wiling out, acting crazy, being basically a bunch of looters, taking stuff that does not belong to them, pillaging, conquering, imperialistic, whatever term you want to put on top of it, a conquistador, a looter, an imperialist, they're all the same to me, baby. Are you listening? One form of looting is not better than another. Hello. And so right here, they come and they find this land that doesn't belong to them, and they explore it, and it looks like it's going to be easy for them to take. While they're exploring this land, come on down to verse 5, they also find Micah in his house. Birds of like feathers flock together, and they find this person, Micah. They find his priest, and they go, man, you're a priest? Well, then inquire of God to learn whether or not our journey will be successful. And, of course, this lying priest doesn't know how to hear from God no more than I know how to communicate with the space station. But he gets a word. Oh, I got a word. I got a word for you, Danites. Go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. 
The Lord's approval? Son, you have lost the Lord's approval a while back. The moment you left Judah, you lost the Lord's approval. But now you're going to approve of this looting and to this wickedness. My friends, that's exactly what I hear going on today, that the pastor approves of this. Oh, my pastor approves of this. Friend, your pastor don't have the approval. You better get the approval of God. You better get the approval of God. You're running over here like this man going to do something for you on judgment day. Well, my pastor's been divorced two times, committed adultery, and he's still pastor. Your pastor's going to have some trouble explaining that on Judgment Day. I'm not saying God can't forgive it, but God's not going to bless that mess. Him just going oopsie all the time, now giving you a bunch of oopsies. So the, the man who does not know how to hear from God says, I heard from God. He's lying. He's just taking his chance. It's better to say something good than to say something bad just in case it does go good. It might go good for him because he's an opportunist, isn't he? He's one that practices pragmatism. He's the one that just loves to see things work his way so that people can be happy. So he wants to tell them something happy. Now, it turns out that he's right and that it goes well for them. So they come back from taking all of this land that's not theirs, and then they now are going to decide what they're going to do. Go to verse 14. Then the five men who had spied out the land of Lashish, uh, Lashish rather, said to their fellow Danites, do you know that one of these houses has an ephod, some household gods, and an image overlaid with gold or overlaid with silver? Now, you know the moment they heard this as looters, they're like, man, we're going to get that. So go to verse 15. So they turned in there, went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place, and greeted him. The 600 Danites armed for battle stood at the entrance of the gate, and then they did what? They went inside, verse 17, took the idol, the ephod, the household gods, while the priests and the 600 men stood at the gate. So these looters come right here and go, hey, We're just going to take some of this. We're going to take some of this. We're going to take some of this. Now, mind you, this was stuff that supposedly they had dedicated to God. But remember, it was cursed from the very beginning because they haven't done this right. Now, go to verse 18 and find out what this young Levite does. When, When they're doing all this, he's just watching them afraid. And then he says to them, what are you doing? This is what he says to them. What are you doing? And they answer back, be quiet. Don't say a word. Come with us. Be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and a clan in Israel as priests rather than just one man's household? The priest was very pleased. He took the ephod, the household gods, the image overlaid with gold, and went along with the people. Listen to what they said to him. Shut your mouth, but come with us. I believe that so many pastors have already heard that from their people. I believe from the entertainment industry. I believe from those on on TV and the media. They have said to the pastors, pastors, shut your mouth. Come with us, and we're going to bring you around a large group of people. That's exactly what they said to this priest. And what I love about it, because it shows you the wickedness of man so we can expose it, the priest said, I'm good with that. He turned on Micah. Why? Because there's no loyalty in the kingdom of Satan. All he was was an opportunist. And so when one person gave him 10 shekels, some clothes, and some food, he was cool with it until the next one came and said, maybe I'll give you 100 shekels, I'll give you Gucci, and I'll let you eat at the finest of restaurants. He said, Micah who? I'm coming with the Danites. I'm a Danite now, man. Look at how the world is today in our generation how quickly they'll just shut their mouths. Listen, church, put on a mask, shut your mouth, and come with us. Don't worry about your illusion, your freedom. We'll put you in front of the mayor. You'll get a picture with the mayor. Shut your mouth and come with us. All you private schools and private colleges, start letting in the LGBTQ transgender. Shut your mouth, and you'll keep getting federal funds and come with us. When Richard Wombrandt, was in a communist jail during the time of the Romanian communist uprising. You can read it in his book, Tortured for Christ, and they also have a movie. He said one of the things that the communists would do as a form of brainwashing and a form of manipulation is they would bring in the pastors and the leaders who had turned with their wives to come in and to have a meal set before them. They then would sit down with them. They would be in their prison clothes, some of them 
partially or all the way naked, rags of clothes. They would be tortured, beaten, placed in excruciating places like outdoors in the cold for hours at a time. They would sit them at the table and the food that they had longed to eat would be right there and across that table would be a pastor and his wife dressed to the nines. This is what they did for psychological warfare. He said, then the pastors and the wives would say to the prisoners, it's not what you think. We still have our churches. We are still Christians. They have not done anything to us. You have believed falsely about them. They have given us government jobs outside of here, Romania is the nicest it's ever been. You are a fool to stay here. You don't have to fight this fight. Just allow the communist government to have the control, and everything will go good with you now. Look at us. It's exactly what they did in China. The underground church is that by definition. It is underground, but there is a state church. There is. Most people don't know about it. There is a church approved by the Chinese government, and it is that church that they use to manipulate the underground churches to come out so that then they can still have their religion and their communism too. Richard Warmbrandt said that as they would deny them, they would get angrier and angrier, and then they would throw them back into the prison. And then what they would do is they would send him letters forged supposedly from his wife and kids that said, Dad, husband, we've changed. You're all alone. We're not praying for this breakthrough. We're not praying for this situation to, cha to change in that way. We're just praying you humble yourself and get along with it. That's how they would psychologically mess with them. And then Richard Wombrandt said, in that cell, with the supposed knowledge that all prosperity belonged to communism, that all of his family members had turned, and that all he had left was Christ. He began to pace in that cell and just say, Jesus, you're worth it all. Jesus, I love you. He said that he would get starved and deprived to the point he couldn't even remember all of the hymns he would know. But he made a decision in his heart he would not trade Jesus for a quote-unquote better life, that he was willing to die for Jesus and of course, when he came out, he saw it was all a lie and his family had been waiting for him. But it sounds like the real Jesus to me. When Jesus went to people, did he say, come, follow me, and I'll give you the pleasures of this world? No, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He said, many will betray each other, father to brother, mother to child. They will turn on each other, but whoever acknowledges me, I'll acknowledge before my father. And he said, whoever stands to the end will be saved. And he said, even if you make it all the way to the ends of the earth, I'll be with you always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Sadly, Micah lost his opportunist priest. But let's keep going in this story. Let's see what happens to these Danites. Micah then comes running up to these Danites and says, what are you guys doing? They look back at him and go, what's the matter? Why did you call out your men to fight? And then Micah says, you've taken our gods, verse 24. You've taken my priests, and you've taken away everything I have. What else do I have? He asked, what's the matter with you guys? Why would you do this to me? And then they looked at him and said, don't argue with us, or some of our men may get angry and attack you, and you and your family will lose your lives. Why was David a man after God's heart? Because David would have died that day with a sword in his hand. Are you listening? Why was David the kind of person that God said, I'm with him? It's because when Saul started turning his back away from the battle, David went down to the battle as a young boy and said, I'll take down that Goliath in Jesus' name. I know some of you think capitulating and not fighting is the way to go, but God is looking for those who want to be conquerors in this end times who are 
are not going to back down. You see, because those who have compromised, they're going to keep on compromising and being pimped by the devil. But I believe God is looking for a generation that will stand and fight, that will take the sword of God in their hand, and having done all that they can do after they have stand, they will stand some more. Because we may not be in a battle with physical swords, but we are in a battle versus powers and powers of principalities of spiritual darkness. And I'm wanting to notice anybody want to stand and fight in the name of Jesus. See, the devil will make a coward out of you just so that he can forward his kingdom as he uses and abuses you. Micah with his tail tucked between his legs lets it go down And after all, he was worshiping the false gods and idols anyways. But try that with a real Israelite. Try to take something that doesn't belong to you and see what happens. That's why David was such a different kind of person coming out of this chaos and and just the the fog of the judges that had no moral compass. David comes with the spirit of a warrior and a worshiper. In his war was worship, and in his worship was war. Jesus is looking for the warrior that is also a worshiper of the real God. Are you listening to me? And I'm not talking about a physical fight. I'm talking about a spiritual fight. Now listen to the end of the story, the sad end, as Vinny comes, please. Verse 27, they take Micah. Or Micah rather went back. They take over this land the Danites do. They then live there. We now know the Levite's name is Jonathan. And then look at verse 30. They set the idol up. They make this a part of their worship for their community. Imagine now all the people they lead astray because of this. That idol remained there, they said, until their time of captivity. Look at it. It says, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of captivity of the land, and they kept using the idol of Micah. Isn't that something? Way back at the beginning, there was a mother that had money that had come from the blessings of the Lord. But because she didn't want the ways of God, it turned into a curse for her family And then the generation that came after it, it caused a mess among the tribes. And then lastly, this tribe of Dan embraces this until the time of captivity. Why were they captive? Why did God allow the enemies to take over Dan? And not only that tribe, but all the others is because of the stupidity of stories like this. They became themselves a curse and got captured and overthrown. Think about it. The Danites take the priest from Micah. The Babylonians take the Danites. And then the Greeks take the Babylonians. And then the Romans take the Babylonians. Uh, Take the Greeks. Captivity begins to mark their people. It didn't seem like a big compromise at first, did it? It was just one guy messing around with something that didn't belong to him, but it belonged to his family. I'm going to ask you a question today as a preacher, but I don't want you to see it just as you are in these four walls. I want you to see it as you are in your job, with your family, in your community. And the question is, are you willing to follow Jesus no matter what it costs, or are you looking for a trade? Because if you're looking for a trade, there's another religion coming to make a trade with you that might look better. There's another promotion coming your way to make a trade with you that might look better. There's another relationship, another boo, another husband, another wife that's coming to make a trade with you on that marriage. Young people, look at me. There's another group of friends There's another thing to do on the weekends that may look fun to make a trade. Because if you're here for humanism, that's going to get old real quick because you're not always going to be happy here. 
Serving God is not always going to make you happy in your feelings, though I do believe there's a joy full of glory. But I'm talking about sometimes your feelings might get hurt. Sometimes your legs might get tired. Sometimes you might mentally get exhausted. But I'm asking you, are you doing this for humanism or are you doing it for God? Pragmaticism, it may not always work. It may not always go your way. But are you going to stick through it to see what God has for you? The first person that I did a one-on-one with, our discipleship with, she got offended before the lesson even started. She got offended at the pre-class requirements. She didn't want to come to church at a certain time because I said, if you want to be in discipleship, you got to come an hour early. She said, well, my job won't let me. I said, no problem. When you can get it off, we'll do it. She said, you mean you're not going to let me do it now? I said, no. She walked out the church, never saw her for a few years first person I thought we had to do discipleship with. We started this church in our house. Then we get to the second phase of our discipleship. Many years later, it's called the 201, where we train you up to be a leader. The first group that I had to even get to that point were young people, because our church was mostly youth at that time. I had a group of four young people all look at me and say, this is too hard. I don't want to do this. This is requiring too much. Yet they were on city championship baseball teams. Yet they were getting aged to get into their colleges. But they said, we won't give that same effort to God. They quit on my first 201 class. And I looked at a book that nobody wanted to read. And I said, did I even do this right? The first group of elders and deacons that we finally got to get raised up here started confessing sin to me, and I had a decision to make. Would I sit them down? A couple came to me with tears in the middle of the night, and they said, you just ordained us as a deacon, but we really been sleeping together this whole time. And at that moment, I had a choice. I could keep looking as a successful pastor as our church was growing with these elders and deacons, or I could look like a fool as I sit them back down, and I don't have any leaders. And I said, I'm choosing God's way. You're sitting down, went back to having no leaders. I've been through this too long to tell you that it's always going to be easy and that you're always going to feel it. you got to make a decision by faith to go with God, even when you're put into the lion's den, even when you're thrown into the fiery furnace. And you don't do it for man because man will let you down. You do it for God. You do it for God. But the way you serve and honor God's church is the way you show you honor God. And I say that to young people with your parents as well, and I say that to married couples as you treat each other as a reflection of how you treat God. One of the young men in my my Bible college, uh, you know, the Bible college we have here, he came from the homosexual lifestyle. He said, I can't do this anymore. He quit. He became a homosexual pastor, and he got quick fame. He got quick attention. He came and wrote a scathing review. You can still find it on Google. He was the first one to call us a cult. He called us a cult before it was cool to call us a cult, I guess, because now we get called that all the time. But if you find him on our Google review, he'll tell you that we're not loving the homosexuals and all this and this. But the story behind that was is we were teaching him God loves you just the way you are, but too much to let you stay that way. And he died from a disease. I'm not saying that's part of the curse. I'm just saying he died. You all figured that part out. But he died as a young man. And I can't tell you today that he went to heaven because if he was living as he was promoting his lifestyle, the Bible says no one shall enter the kingdom of heaven that way. So I already have seen people come and go, friends, for the easier road. And now their judgment has already come upon them as well. And I want to encourage you today to see the end from the beginning. To not just look for the quick way, the quick fix. To stick with what God is doing in this nation, in this city, in this church, in your family. Because I know it's going to get even tougher. This, the Bible says, is just the beginning. What are you going to do when they say you can't buy or sell unless you get a mark? And I guarantee you, they'll have all their line of pastors saying, it's good, guys. Look, I still worship God. I'm not possessed of the devil. Look at me. I'm still preaching. One day I posted on our Facebook page a preacher who was preaching, singing, all that. And I said, does anybody notice anything different? Most of them couldn't. He was a homosexual bishop. Nobody really could tell the difference. You're going to have to be discerning in these end times. The Bible says if these days were not cut short, even the elect would be deceived. And so I just want to let you know in my heart, I'm making my decision to go all the way with Jesus. 
And so I give you permission to come to me and call me out if you ever see me selling out for 10 shekels in a shirt. If you ever see me sell out, then come to me. And if I can be my brother's keeper, then I'll come to you because we're going to need each other in these final hours. You see, if that Levi would have stayed into the house of Judah, there would have been a blessing for him there because there was a David that was coming. You see, if that mama would have kept her silver, she could have been a part of that temple that Solomon was going to build. She could have had a testimony that would have lasted through the ages, but instead she went for that temporary pleasure and lost their reward. I just want to know if there's anybody here today that wants to stand and fight with the Davids. Even if you don't feel like it, you're going to go all the way with God and we're going to see God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you stand up and give it up for Jesus today? Somebody say he's the king of kings. Come on, he's the Lord of